I'm Ken Spector with Happy Cow. I'm here on Vegan Travels, all vegan Baltic cruise. I'm here with plant-based physician, Dr. Michael Clapper. He is also a lecturer. Dr. Clapper, people I meet and you meet in this world are addicted to foods. They're addicted to meat and addicted to things that just are not good for them. Why is that? Uh, we have wiring that makes us desire these sweet foods and these salty, chewy foods, and the food industry have, has obliged by designing these wonderful hyperpalatable foods that pander to those taste desires. Uh, but meanwhile, you f create a generation of people who are eating foods that aren't healthy for them. But uh, uh, we're right now kind of a victim of the of the food industry, who's uh, been playing to these basic uh, desires that we have. And your job and mine is to help people satisfy those desires with foods that don't hurt them. Let's take vegan cheese and let's take dairy cheese, okay? What is the difference in terms of our health? Oh, there's just a tremendous difference. Uh, people are quick to criticize the the vegan alternatives to meats and cheese, etc. But actually, I'm a fan of them. They're uh, people say, well, they're just as bad. They've got just as much fat, uh, but it's a different kind of fat. It's vegetable oil versus saturated animal fats. But very importantly, you don't have all the dairy constituents. You don't have the the casein and allergenic proteins. You don't have the antibiotics the cow's been fed. You don't have leukemia viruses that the uh, that the bovine get uh, you don't have the the cow pus that's uh, that shows up in the in, in all milk products um, uh, all the way around uh, you don't have that dairy influence so I think there's a huge difference between the two no one's saying these vegan cheeses are the bastion of health foods but it's a little treat to put on a sandwich once a week I, th I think they're just fine why is it so difficult for people to get off of meat why is it such a challenge? I think mostly desirous of that, that chewy, salty taste in our mouth, but there's also a fear that I'm not going to be getting the iron I need, I won't be getting enough protein I need, and, and of course the advertising around us panders to that as well. Uh, but mostly, again, it's just that, that ancient desire for that salty, chewy texture that we have, as well as, a, as a, that comfort food and that comfort belief, because mommy fed us this when we're from our earliest times, and we're really, really attached to this as part of security as well as nutrition so uh, these ancient mechanisms are involved I've seen people they get off of meat or they stop eating meat for a, f a week or two and they say that they feel lousy mm -hmm. and then when they get back on meat they feel great Absolutely. why is that I think what you're looking at is an acquired dependency these folks have been fed animal flesh two three times a day since infancy and after 30 years of that your body depends on those preformed floods of carnitine and creatine and muscle based nutrients from the meat flooding through the tissues two three times a day and we get uh, dependent upon it uh, when you suddenly take that away, most folks can make their own carnitine, creatine, etc. But some folks, uh, may, there might be a big long lag of weeks or months before they can gear up their cellular mechanisms to make these molecules. And during that time, they draw down on their own stores and don't feel so good. And then they eat some meat and feel better. And they think that they're proving that they're natural carnivores. But they're really just someone who's uh, had a dependency fostered in them since infancy. This is not normal human physiology. People People raised as vegans don't experience this. They don't have meat cravings. Uh, this is an acquired dependency, which we have to respect because it's a real thing. And some folks may have to wean off over months and maybe have a little bit of meat and during the taper off product uh, process once a week or so till they eventually phase it out of their diet. Now, this is a real phenomenon, uh, but it is not a validation that we are natural meat eaters. It's a validation that feeding a human infant meat three times a day can hook them on uh, animal flesh. Uh, during in their lives, uh, but this is not normal physiology, and it's definitely possible to overcome it. Do you believe anyone who has a what is considered a decent diet, let's say it's either a vegan diet or a person who eats the occasional meat, should be taking statins? Oh, absolutely not. Um, the, the whole atherosclerotic phenomenon that these statins are directed towards are a completely dietary induced disease. It's, it's a sign from our body that we are not flesh eating apes. And, and as we eat a flesh based diet, all these dangerous changes show up in our blood vessels. And the statins are trying to, to extinguish that. But it's our body waving a flag saying, This is the wrong fuel, and you're inflaming our arteries because of it. <clears throat> so, 
Um, no, if you don't eat anybody else's cholesterol, there's no reason to be on a medicine that turns down your liver's ability to make your own cholesterol. So no, the statins should not be part of normal physiology. There aren't any people out there that should be taking statins? Not if they're eating a completely vegan diet. Uh, no, there's no reason they should be injuring their arteries. Uh, now, if they're junk food vegans and are eating much saturated fat and all of that, then that's, but again, they, that's a sign to clean up your diet, not to take statins. Um, so no, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're banging your shin into the coffee table three times a day, mm -hmm. is it a matter of, well, take, take ibuprofen every day to keep down the inflammation? No, stop banging your table and get your lay against the table every day. And the same thing. Don't keep injuring your arteries and then take this pill to try and to damp down the artery injury. Um, and no, this is a sign that, uh, that the diet is abnormal, not that we have a, a need for these statins. What supplements do you feel vegans would benefit from taking? This is always a difficult subject in that uh, people say, well, if a vegan diet is natural, why do I have to take any vitamin B12? Because vitamin B12 comes from the soil. And when we were living earth-connected lives and we were foraging for roots and tubers and pulling them out of the ground and just eating them without washing them, we would get the same B12 flowing through our system that the deer and the antelope have flowing through their systems every day. And we would drink out of streams and we'd get B12 that way. Well, modern sanitation has eliminated those natural sources of B12. Nobody's eating unwashed vegetables. No one's drinking out of streams. And it's for that reason that all people on plant-based diets need to take some vitamin B12 at least once a week, if not two or three times a week. Um, so I certainly do that. Um, there's a couple other th nutrients that can be a bit challenging for vegans to get. If you live your life inside like we all do, then our vitamin D levels go down. So it's a good idea. I take 2,000 uh, international units of vitamin D every day. Um, there's, there's concern about uh, DA and uh, brain health. And uh, just to make sure, I take a little low dose, 250 milligrams of, of algae-derived DHA on most, most days. Iodine is an issue for your thyroid. And it's because vegans don't eat fish. You need some iodine for your thyroid. So I make sure that I have uh, either a, a sprinkle of kelp or uh, sea vegetables on my salad uh, a couple times a week. So that's my, my iodine supplement there. Um, that's uh, basically my supplement program. Omega-3s and flaxseed. Is that enough as, as far as omega-3s go? Just grinding flax seeds every day on your on your salad, or do we need sort of an algae-based, as vegans, algae-based DHA EPA supplement? Yes. Um, vegans, I think, in general, uh, go along the bottom level of DHA adequacy because we're not eating meat and fish, etc., which are usual uh, sources for them. Uh, so we're always kind of scraping bottom. So I, I think it's a good idea to take that preformed DHA, which is why I do. Could you do this all on uh, flax seeds and uh, hemp seeds, etc.? In theory, you could. Your your body can take the uh, the linolenic acid, 18 carbon atoms long, in, in the flax seeds, and add two more carbon atoms and two more carbon atoms and make it into DHA. But I don't know if I want to bet my brain and spinal cord on, on that over the next 20, 30 years that I'm going to be able to, to make that transformation. I don't know how efficient my uh, enzymes are. So it's more just kind of an insurance policy that I take that DHA. In theory, you could do it off lax seeds. Uh, but again, it's, it's, a, it's a bet that I choose not to make. What is the healthiest way to cook? And what are the least healthy ways to cook? Absolutely. Uh, the more you add heat to food, the deader it gets. That's true. But it does not mean we should all be raw food vegans. There are some nutrients that are absorbed better from cooked foods, like lycopene uh, from tomatoes. Uh, and you're going to eat a lot more steam kale than you will raw kale. And steaming the kale does not destroy the protein or the minerals uh, or most of the vitamins. So I think as long as water is involved, uh, is the three ways to get heat into food using water, I think are, are pretty safe as far as the nutrients. And that's just a, a, taking your vegetables and put them for five or eight minutes in a vegetable steamer, I think, causes minimal damage. Second is adding hot water to soften starches. And that's how you make oatmeal and rice. And, and I don't think you're damaging the proteins or the vitamins or minerals uh, in, in the vegetables as you soften them that way in the grains. Uh, and then finally, there's actually cooking with water to make a stew or a soup. And, and I think that can be very beneficial. And I think the nutrient loss is minimal. So as long as water is involved, I think you're... Uh, 
not exposing the vegetables to any temperature higher than hot water, and I think that's minimally damaging. So water-based cooking is generally, quote, safe, uh, but when you get into dry heat cooking, when you get into baking and grilling, and certainly frying is the worst thing to do to your food, so it's been frying in hot oil, um, then, you, then I think those are destructive uh, ways of cooking, and I really uh, uh, suggest you avoid those. Uh, that said, you can do a quick stir fry in a hot wok using vegetable broth. You uh, get the wok hot, put the put the put your broth in, follow it immediately, those cold, wet, sloppy vegetables. Do your stir fry, bring the temperature up of the vegetables, and then out of the pan. And if you do that, uh, I think that that's minimally damaging. Uh, but uh, that's the only kind of frying that I was, was uh, I think is acceptable. Uh, but frying in hot oil till things get crispy is not a good way to treat your food. What are vegans dying from versus meat eater, dairy eaters? Right. Um, I can't really answer that question um, scientifically um, because the only ones that really matter are the people who've been raised as vegans since birth. In other words, everybody else, you, me, etc., whatever our cause of demise is going to be, um, our initial 20, 30, 40 years of meat eating had a big influence in what diseases we're going to eventually develop uh, and, uh, and that will carry us off this mortal coil. And uh, so whatever, uh, you know, so-and-so, Joe Vegan dies, oh, um, the vegan diets aren't healthy. Well, what did he eat for the 40 years before him? What disease processes did he start in his arteries or his colon, et cetera? Um, until we see uh, the mortality statistics from lifetime vegans uh, who've been eating nothing but plant foods over their entire lifespan, then we can, uh, we can tell you exactly what, they, what they're going to die of. And, uh, uh, and the body eventually wears out cosmic rays and exposure to uh, environmental toxins take their toll eventually. But you want to, to do good work and laugh and love for 125 years and then uh, go to sleep one night and uh, drift off to some other plane there. But uh, again, uh, it's hard to make mortality statistics uh, mean anything on people who've only recently switched to vegan diets. What about the person who switched at 12 years old or... 20 years old and is now 50 years old. So what point does putting vegetables through your system and fruits through your system sort of counteract all the damage you've done in your earlier years? Well, again, everybody's different. Depends on their genetics. Depends on what eating the, the animal foods for the first 12 or 20 years, what genes that woke up and set in motion, etc. Even those those short early, you know, 10, 20 uh, early years, they're certainly ha they have an effect genetically. Um, so it doesn't mean that we're we're damaged or you can't turn those gen genes off. And and uh, the food does change us on a daily basis. Um, but again, you can, given an individual's person's genetics. Plus their early exposure. Maybe they live next to an oil refinery. Maybe they're, they're an asphalt factory was the fumes wafted by and, and got into their tissues when they were young. But this life you know, introduces so many variables. It's really hard to draw any hard, fast rules. Uh, we're biological creatures living in a very complex and polluted world. So you're, you're going to be seeing these effects manifest depending on people's genetics, et cetera. Um, but there's no question... Uh, was behind your uh, the issue you raise is that you know meal after meal of whole plant foods do good things in our body and they damp down those genes driving inflammation and then uh, that spawn cancers etc uh, it's definitely a healthy diet is it going to mean you're going to live forever no but uh, you're going to probably live more disease-free years due to that uh, diet and that's the most important thing for people who go to the hospital with cancer and perhaps have a blockage where they can't eat any longer, I've seen hospitals giving patients basically what, what I see is the first ingredient, corn solids, and second ingredient, corn oil. It seems to be high caloric, but it doesn't seem like there's much nutrition in that. Why is that? Why are hospitals giving cancer patients, do you call it sugar water? 
Indeed, and it's so sad uh, on so many levels. That you know that one vignette that you described says so much about medicine's approach to nutrition, about the way patients are treated in hospitals, etc. And they're failing them desperately. Uh, the, the the most doctors don't recognize that there's any connection between what their patients are eating and cancer at all. They go, oh, eat whatever you want. Just get those calories in, and they don't understand that uh, that these high energy foods may be driving the cancer cancer growth and the, the sugars and the meats that spawn IGF-1 production and by your liver I actually make the cancer grow faster, yeah, but they don't believe that food has anything to do with anything, including cancer. And it's, and it's sad, and the dietitians don't help with that, and they just uh, do the doctor's bidding. Uh, and so along comes these manufactured foods that you describe. Um, the reality is that people need to be nourished but, but by whole foods that don't drive cancer growth uh, unnecessarily. Um, and uh, I recommend that people uh, make up their own hospital food. Uh, if you've got a loved one in the hospital, then make up a soup or a stew. Put in all these wonderful vegetables. And if you need to, uh, just before you come to the hospital, put them in a blender and blend, and blend it up. Make a blended soup and, and let your loved one just, just sip on that. And it'll be much better. Most hospitals don't forbid the family bringing in uh, healthy food for their loved one to eat. So I would recommend making your own tube feeding uh, mixture by making up a wonderful uh, vegetable soup and, and then blending it. We do that at our clinic all the time and, and it works very well. So let's say you have two minutes to tell vegans around the world uh, something that they can do to better their lives. What would that be? Be a happy, positive vegan. Um, and don't, you don't have to say much. People will see who you are by the way you look and the way you talk and, and, uh, and the glint in your eye because you know that you're living all your life in a way that affirms love and positivity and the human being at its best. Uh, and so let that wonderful feeling in your heart and that knowing in your, in your mind uh, come out in everything you say and do. The food is easy. Just eat whole foods that you could recognize growing in the garden and your body will take care of the rest. Well, the most important thing uh, is to one set a good example and, and not to proselytize. Just the, the, the truth of who you are will, will get your message across. This is not the time to be waving fingers and, and putting people off. Uh, this is the time to lead by example and, uh, and being a healthy loving vegan is the best example you can set. Terrific, terrific. This is plant-based physician and lecturer, Dr. Michael Clapper. I am Ken Spector with Happy Cow. Thank you so much for your interview today. And please subscribe to our Happy Cow channel and click on the bell for notifications. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.